Welcome everyone. Let's begin our lesson for today by going over the learning goals and success criteria. First, what are we learning? We're learning how to compute exponential expressions on integers and fractions, how to perform basic exponential operations and recognize like terms, how to work with positive, negative, and fractional exponents on integers and variables, how to recognize patterns in linear and exponential functions, how to recognize the differences between linear and exponential functions, how to recognize patterns in the graphs of exponential functions, how to determine how base values, coefficients, and constants will affect the graph of an exponential function, how to graph exponential functions, and how to find function values for exponential decay functions. How are we learning it? Through the Exponential Functions Review Part 1 notes and the Exponential Functions Review Part 1 assignment. When can we use this information? To calculate the amount of money in a savings account including interest, to calculate the amount of money owed on a loan including interest, to examine sales trends at work to determine how much growth is occurring within the company sales, and to complete a variety of tasks through trial and error rather than having to be formally taught the procedures. How do we know we learned it? By getting a score of 4 on the Exponential Functions Review Part 1 assignment. Now let's take a look at our agenda for today. We will begin by going over the learning goals and success criteria. While we do that, you'll fill out your Get It Started. Once you've completed your Get It Started, we'll go over it together and answer any questions that you may have. After that, we'll go over the Exponential Functions Review Part 1 notes, and then I'll give you time to complete the Exponential Functions Review Part 1 assignment. Once you've completed the assignment, we'll go over it together and answer any questions that you may have. At the end of class, we'll go back over our learning goals and success criteria while you fill out your Before You Go. Your only homework for tonight is to continue working on the Exponential Function Study Guide and any incomplete assignments that you may have. Let's take a look now at the Exponential Functions Review Part 1 notes. The notes begin with the learning goals and success criteria. Now, what is an exponent? An exponent is a number that tells you how many times to multiply the base number by itself. So, for instance, we have 2 to the third power. 2 is what we call our base number, and it tells us that we're going to multiply 2 times itself three times. So that's really 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. Now let's talk about positive exponents. So positive exponents mean that the number above here, the number of times we're going to multiply it times itself, is a positive number. So we have 5 squared. Well, that means that we're multiplying 5 times 5, which in this case is 25. Then we have 5 to the third power, which is 5 times 5 times 5, which is 125. And then 5 to the fourth power is 5 times 5 times 5 times 5, which is 625. So we can do this with any exponent. We can take any base number and raise it to an exponent and multiply it by itself a certain number of times and solve. And what about zero and one exponents? So five to the first power. Well, five to the first power is just five, one five, right, times itself, so five, that's it. So that's just five. Now, five to the zero power so there's zero fives, and that's equal to one. Now, please make sure that you understand this. Any number raised to the zero power will always be one. So not zero, but one. So five to the zero power is one. 2,000 to the zero power is one. 200 million to the zero power is one. So any number raised to the zero power is just one. Now, combining like terms, if we look at this, we're going to combine like terms. And the rule is, in order to combine like terms, they have to have the same exponents and same variables. And if they do, we're going to add the coefficients. So for instance, we have 2x and x. Well, they're both x's, so they have the same variables. And they have the same power, same exponent. Really, it's imaginary exponent of 1. So we can just add these. 2x plus x is 3x. We have 3x squared plus 4x squared. Again, same variable. They're both x's. And the powers match, so we just add the coefficients. So that's 3 plus 4, which is 7x squared. We can do it with subtraction as well. So we have 6x cubed minus x cubed. Well, again, same variable, same power. So now we can go ahead and subtract. So 6 minus 1 is 5x cubed. Now we have 7x to the 4th minus x cubed. Well, again, same variable, but this time they do not have the same power, 
So we cannot combine them. It just stays 7x to the fourth minus x cubed. Now, when we multiply or divide exponents, so the rule is this. When we multiply or divide exponential terms, even if they do not have the same exponents, but have the same variable, we can still do it. The rule is we multiply or divide the coefficients and add or subtract the exponents. So if we're multiplying, we're gonna add the exponents. So this is two times one, so that's my coefficient. And I have an x to the first and an x to the first, so I'm gonna add those exponents, so I get one plus one for my exponents. So two times one is two, and one plus one is two, so it should be two x squared. So look at another example of multiplication. So we have three x cubed times four x squared. Now with this one, again, we're gonna multiply the coefficients, so three times four, and we're gonna add the exponents, so three plus two. We end up with three times four, which is 12 x, and three plus two is five, so we get 12 x to the fifth power. Now division is just the opposite. So we're gonna divide the coefficients and subtract the exponents. So we get six x to the seventh divided by two x to the third. So we're gonna divide the coefficients. So two, six divided by two and then subtract the exponents. So it's x to the seven minus third power. So six divided by two is three and seven minus three is four. So we get three x to the fourth. Now here we have seven x to the fourth divided by x cubed. So again, we're gonna divide seven divided by one and x to the fourth minus three, which is seven divided by one is seven and x to the four minus three is first power. And whenever it's the first power, we don't need to put it there. So it's just seven x. Now, what if we have the coefficient and variable inside of parentheses and the power outside? Well, when we do that, we're gonna raise the power by multiplying the exponents. So in this case, we have two x, and this is x to the first, and we're gonna multiply the powers for each of these. So this is really two to the first power times two, and x to the first power times two. So that's really two, two squared times x squared. Well, two squared is four, and x squared is just x squared, so it's four x squared. Let's look at this one. Again, same thing, this is three to the first and x to the squared. So we're gonna multiply each of those by the power out here, which is three. So we got three to the first times three and x to the second times three. Well, we know that three to the first times three is three cubed and two times three is six. So we got three cubed times x to the sixth and three cubed is 27. So it's 27 x to the sixth. Now for this one, we have x squared times y cubed, and we want the whole thing squared. So again, we're gonna multiply it. So x squared times two, and y to the third times two, and we get x to the fourth, y to the sixth, because we multiply two times two is four, and three times two is six. Now we have x, y squared, z cubed to the sixth, so we're just gonna multiply each of the exponents by six. So we get x to the first times six and y to the second times six and z to the third times six. And we're just gonna multiply these out. So one times six is six, two times six is 12, and three times six is 18. So we should get x to the sixth, y to the 12th, z to the 18th. Now let's take a look at negative exponents. So a negative exponent looks like this, where it's five to the negative second power. Now here's the rule with negative exponents. When we're working with a negative exponent, we're gonna rewrite as the reciprocal, meaning instead of this being five to the negative second, we're gonna write it as one over five. And then we're gonna change the power to a positive. So five to the negative second becomes one over five squared. So I made the power positive and, made, and put it under one. Now I just do it like normal. So five squared is 25, so this is one over 25. Now three to the negative third power. So again, that becomes one over three to the positive third power. Three to the positive third power is 27. So it's one over 27. 
Now we have x to the negative sixth power. So we're going to flip that and it becomes 1 over x to the positive sixth power. Now let's take a look at fractional exponents. For instance, we have 25 to the 1 half power. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the base number, 25, and we're going to raise it to the power of the numerator. So it would be 25 to the first power. And then the denominator is going to make up the root we're going to take. So in this case, it will be the second root or square root. So the way that looks is we're going to have 25 to the first power, which is just 25. And then we're going to take the square root of that, just like this. So we, we need to know what number multiplied by itself gets 25. Well, we know that 5 times 5 is 25, so the square root of 25 is 5. Let's look at another example. We have 3 to the 1 third power. So again, we're going to take 3 to the first, and we're going to find the cube root of it. Well, what times itself 3 times equals 3? Well, we should recognize that it doesn't come out evenly. There's no whole number that does that. So we're just going to leave it as cube root of 3. Now we have x to the 2 thirds power. So what we're going to do is we're going to take x and raise it to this power. So it should be x squared. And then we're going to take the cube root of that. So the third root of x squared. And we should notice that there's no number that we can multiply by itself three times to get x squared. So we just leave it as cube root of x squared. Now what if we have a negative and a fractional exponent? Well, we do the same thing we did on the previous two. We're going to go ahead and flip it and make it positive. So we're going to, the x to the negative 1 half becomes 1 over x to the 1 half power, just like that. Now we know that we're going to take the 1 half power, and that becomes x to the first. And then we're going to take the square root of that. So that becomes 1 over the square root of x to the first, which is just x. Now, first of all, what is a linear function? A linear function occurs when the graph of a relation set forms a straight line. So when we plot the points, if it forms a straight line like this, that means it is a linear function. Now, what does a linear function look like as a table? Well, if we look at the table here, the rule is if all of these in each column, so this column and this column, if the change is all consistent and it's addition, then we say that the set is linear. So for instance, we have one, two, three, four. So we can see that it is consistent, there is a consistent pattern, and the pattern is that we're adding by one, so that's addition. So now if we look at this side, we have two, four, six, eight. Again, consistent pattern, addition by two. So is there a steady change in the number of months? Yes, we're changing by one month each time. Is there a steady change in the amount of rainfall? Yes, there is. We're changing by two each time. So therefore, we could say, yes, this set is linear. And if we were to graph it, it would look something like this and form a straight line. So that's a linear function based on a table. Now from graphs, again, the rule is they form a straight line. So this is an example of a linear function. This is also an example of a linear function as is this one. It can go up or down. It can be really steep or really flat. This is another example. Again, really flat and going downward. This one's steep and going downward. So all of these form what we call linear functions. Now, how can we recognize linear functions as an equation? Well, it should be of the form y equals mx plus b. Or it could be f of x equals mx plus b. An example of this would be y equals 1 half x minus 3. This would be an example of a linear function. Notice the powers for both y and x are 1. Now what is an exponential function? An exponential function is a function that forms a curved line that has a line that it will never cross. For instance, this is an exponential function. It's a curved line. It's a single curve. It starts low and works its way up. It could go this direction also, start high and work down. But it has a line it never crosses. Notice this line gets really flat here at the x-axis. It will never cross the x-axis. So there's a line here that forms that it'll never cross. In this direction, it'll keep going and going and going and get really steep. How can we recognize exponential functions from a table? 
Well, first of all, the rule is the number of months my x values should be changing by a consistent amount and it should be addition. And my y values should be changing by multiplication. So in this case, we have the months. So this is one, two, three, four. Well, is there a steady change in the number of months? Yes, there is, and it's changing by one month each time. Now here we have 2, 4, 8, 16. There is a steady change, and it is multiplication. We're multiplying by 2 each time. 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 2 is 16. So we're seeing a steady change, and it's multiplication. It is doubling, or multiplying by 2 each month. So therefore, is this exponential? Yes, it is. And if we were to plot these points, it would look something like this and form this curve. Now, what do exponential functions look like as graphs? They always form a curve, a single curve. So, for instance, this is an exponential function. This, even if I shift it over, it's still considered an exponential function. If I have it go downward, that's an exponential function. And if I have it go below the x-axis, still an exponential function. All of these are examples of exponential functions. Now, exponential functions are of the form y equals a to the x times b. Or it could be f of x equals a to the x times b. Here, an example of this is y equals 3 to the x times 4. Now, if you notice in all of these, y has a power of 1, and x is the power of the base number. So these are exponential functions. So how can we compare these? So the question says, based on the table below, does each table represent a linear function, exponential function, or neither? Well, if we look at this one, we have two, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this one's consistent and going up by 1. So it could be either linear or exponential at this point. Then we have 3, 6, 12, 24, 48. Well, 3 plus 3 is 6. 6 plus 3 is not 12, so it's not linear. So 3 times 2 is 6. 6 times 2 is 12. 12 times 2 is 24. 24 times 2 is 48. So that means it's got to be exponential. Now this one, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So we do have a consistent pattern. We are adding by 2. So it could be either linear or exponential. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, 1 plus 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5. So it's, they're both consistent, they're both addition, therefore it's got to be linear. Now this one says negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. So again, we're adding by 1 each time, so it could be either linear or exponential at this point. Then we go 8, 4, 0, 4, 8. So here we, add, we subtracted 4, subtracted 4, then we added 4 added for. So it's not a consistent pattern, so therefore it's neither linear nor exponential. Now we have our graphs. We're supposed to determine whether it's linear, exponential, or neither. Well, this first one does have a curve, but it curves in both directions, which we know the exponentials only curve in one direction, so therefore this is neither linear nor exponential. Then this one, we have a straight line. Well, we know a straight line forms a linear function, so that one is linear. This one has a single curve, so that one is exponential. Now, looking at the equations, we have y equals 2 thirds x minus 4. Well, both of them have a power of 1, and we have both the x and y, so that one we said was linear. It also looks like y equals mx plus b, so we know it's linear. Now this one is y equals 2 thirds times negative 4 to the x power. Well, we should notice that looks like b times a to the x, which is exponential. So this one is an exponential function. This one says y equals 2 thirds times the absolute value of x minus 4. Again, it looks similar to this one. We have x to the first power and y to the first power, but the absolute value changes things, so it is neither linear nor exponential. Now, let's take a look at exponential functions with bases less than 1. So when the base of an exponential function is less than 1, the curve will remain above the x-axis, and the curve will be the same, but the curve will go down instead of up. For example, we have y equals 1 third to the x power times 4. 
So notice this is smaller than one, and a normal curve goes up, but if we have a value here, a base number less than one, it's gonna go downward as we go from left to right. So it looks exactly the same as three to the x, except it's just mirrored over to the other side and going this direction. Now what if the base is negative? Well, when the base is negative, the graph will flip below the x-axis and will go down instead of up. For instance, we have y equals negative three to the x times four. So here, it's gonna flip and go downward below the x-axis. It's gonna be exactly the same graph as three to the x, but it's just gonna be down this direction. So it's gonna be like it was reflected down below the x-axis. Now what if we were to add a constant? So when a constant is added to an exponential function, the graph will shift up or down, but the curve will stay the same. So if we had y equals three to the x times four plus two, then it would look like this. So we would take, it would look exactly the same as y equals three to the x times four, except we're gonna slide it up two units. So now the line it doesn't cross is y equals two instead of the x-axis. Now, what if it was three to the x times four minus two? Same thing, except now it's gonna shift down and go this direction. So it's the same as three to the x times four, except we're gonna slide it down, and now the line it won't cross is y equals negative two. Now, what if we do a sum of exponents, meaning we're add something to the exponent? Well, that will cause the graph to shift to the right or to the left. So for instance, we have y equals three to the x plus two times four. So what that should look like is, notice it's the same curve, and because this is in the exponent, we're always gonna go opposite. So you would think that we'd go x plus two means we're gonna slide to the right. But because it's in the exponent, we're gonna go opposite. So it becomes x minus x plus two becomes a shift to the left. So notice it's the same graph as three to the x times four, except we slid it to the left two units. Now what if it was three to the x minus two times four? Well, same thing. We're gonna slide it, but this time we're gonna slide it to the right two, because we always go opposite when we talk about exponents, so we slide it to the right two, and it becomes this graph. It should look exactly the same as three to the x times four, except we're gonna slide it to the right. There's a video here that shows you how to check exponential functions in Desmos, so you can go ahead and watch that video as well. Now, what is exponential growth? Exponential growth is a function where a quantity increases by the same rate in each time period. For an example, money in a savings account. So I put money into my savings account, my money increases with interest, and it goes up exponentially. Now what is exponential growth formula? The exponential growth formula is f of x, or y, is equal to a times one plus r to the x power. So a is our starting amount, that's how much we start with. If we we're talking about money in a bank account, that's how much money we put into the account. r is the rate of change, meaning how much interest are we gaining? x is the amount of time, so let's say it's, it goes monthly and we're doing it over 12 months. 12 months would be my x. Now notice the value inside the parentheses will always be greater than one with exponential growth because I'm adding one plus some number. It doesn't matter what number that is, it won't be negative. So we know it'll always be greater than one. So let's look at exponential decay now. Now exponential decay is a function where a quantity decreases by the same rate in each time period. An example of this would be radioactive decay of a fossil. So when something dies, it eventually becomes just bones, right? We know this for, through archaeology. It becomes just bones. And what happens is there's a certain amount of carbon in that bone. After a while, the carbon starts to decay. It starts to, to wither away. It starts to evaporate. From there, we can tell how old the fossil is based on the amount of carbon that's still left. So that's radioactive decay of a fossil. Now, exponential decay, 
The formula looks like this. F of x equals a times 1 minus r to the x. So it's the same as growth, except this is minus r instead of plus r. A is still the starting amount. That's how much we start with. So if we were talking money in, that we owed, well, that might be a, right? So that's our starting amount, how much we owe. R is the rate of change. How much are we paying each month? X is the amount of time. So let's say we're paying it off in 12 months. And then notice the value inside the parentheses will always be less than 1 because it's 1 minus some value. And we know that R is never going to be negative. So we're, it's 1 minus some value. So that means it's going to be something less than 1. Now, how can we recognize growth versus decay in graphs? Well, growth is always going to go up. Decay will always go down. So exponential growth goes up. Exponential decay goes down. How do we recognize it from equations? Well, exponential growth equations always have a base value greater than 1. So it could look like this. Y equals 3 times 1 plus 0 0.4 to the X. So obviously that's greater than 1 when we add those together. Or it could be something like this where they already added it together for you where it's y equals 3 times 1.04 to the x, which obviously this number is greater than 1. So that's growth. Decay always is less than 1 inside the parentheses. So we have something like this, y equals 1 minus 0 0.4 to the x. Or they might have already done it for us and had y equals 3 times 0 0.06 to the x, which both of these we can tell are going to, when we simplify them, are going to be less than 1. So that's decay. So how can we tell? Let's look at an example. We have f of x equals 1 half to the x. Well, 1 half is less than 1, so that is decay. We have 3 halves x. Well, that's bigger than 1, right? Because that's 1 and a half, so that's growth. 7 eighths. Well, that's smaller than 1, so that's decay. 4 thirds. Again, that's bigger than 1, so that's growth. And 1 third is less than 1, so that is decay. Notice it didn't matter that they put a coefficient. It didn't matter that they messed with the exponents. This is the only number that matters. If it's bigger than 1, it's growth. If it's smaller than 1, it's decay. Let's look at a word problem for exponential growth. It says the population of Chicago in 2016 was estimated to be 35,000 people with the annual rate of increase of 24%. What is the population in 2019? So first of all, we're going to go ahead and use our formula of f of x equals a times 1 plus r to the x. And we're going to plug in the starting amount. Well, what did it start out at? Well, it started out at 35,000. So that goes in for a. So this is f of x equals 35,000 times 1 plus r to the x. Then we're going to plug in our rate of change. Well, we can see that it changes by 24%. Well, 24% we need to write as a decimal. So this is really 24.0%, right? So we're going to move the decimal back two places, one, two. So it should change to be 0 0.24. And then lastly, we're going to plug in the amount of time. And the amount of time between 2016 and 2019 is three years. So this is f of x equals 35,000 times 1 plus 0 0.24 to the third power. We'll solve that using a calculator. And when we do that, we end up with 66,731.84 people. So that should be the population of Chicago in 2019. Let's look at another example. So it says we opened up a bank account four years ago with $300. You have a 7% interest rate on your account. How much money do you have now? So again, we're going to start with our exponential growth formula. So we're going to plug in the starting amount. Our starting amount was $300. So we plug that in for A. Then we're going to plug in our rate of change for R. It says we're going up by 7%. So that's we move the decimal back two places. So that's 0 0.07 is our rate of change. And then we're going to go by the amount of time. We're going to plug that in. The amount of time was four years. So we plug four in for X. And then we solve using a calculator. And when we do that, we end up with $393.24. Now let's look at exponential decay. So this time the population in Chicago was decreasing by 24%. So we start here with our equation. 
of a times 1 minus r to the x. We know it's minus because we're decreasing. And we're going to plug in the starting amount. The starting amount was 35,000, and that goes in for a. Then we plug in our rate of change. Our rate of change is 24%, so we're going to move the decimal back two places. 1, 2, so that's 0 0.24. And then we plug in our amount of time. The amount of time is from 2016 to 2019. That's three years. And then I solve using a calculator, and I get 15,364.16 people. So look at one more exponential decay word problem. So it says you opened up a bank loan four years ago with $300. You pay 7% of the remaining balance each year. How much money do you owe now? So again, it's decay because we're, the amount of money we owe is going down. So we start with f of x equals a times 1 minus r to the x. So the first thing we do is plug in our starting amount. Our starting amount is $300. So that goes in for a. And we're making payments. So we're going to plug in our rate of change. We're paying 7% each time. So it's 7. We're going to move the decimal back two places. So 1, 2. So that's 0 0.07. Lastly, we're going to plug in the amount of time. The amount of time is four years, so that's four. We plug that into our calculator, and we get that now we owe $224.42. There's a video here that shows you how to check exponential functions in Desmos, so you can go ahead and watch that video as well. Let's talk now about how we can use Desmos to check our work when dealing with exponential functions. So we'll go here to desmos.com. And we're going to click on Graphing Calculator. And it should take us to a page that looks like this. Right here is where we can enter the equation for our exponential function. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's say it was y equals 2 to the x. Well, as we can see, it graphs it for us. It shows us what, kind, what the curve looks like. And we can enter any equation in here. Let's say we had y equals 1 half to the x minus 5 power. Well, now it has our new equation with our curve going down, and it is half as steep, right? And we can see that it slid over to the right. So we can graph any equation using Desmos and check our work so that we can see exactly what the graph of the line should look like. So that's how you can use Desmos to check your work when dealing with exponential functions. Let's take a look now at how to complete the exponential functions review part one assignment. Our assignment begins with our learning goals and success criteria. If we scroll down, we can see the questions. The first one says, what is three to the third power? Well, three to the third power is three times three times three. So three times three times three is, three times three is nine times three is 27. So we'll go ahead and mark that as our answer. And let's go ahead and pick another one. How about this one? A to the ninth divided by A to the third. Remember, anytime we divide, we're going to just subtract the exponents. So this is A to the 9 minus 3. Well, 9 minus 3 is 6. So we get A to the sixth power. It says, which of the following graphs could represent the function below? Y equals 4 to the x. Well, 4 to the x, we know it's going to go up. So this one's out and this one's out. So it's got to be one of these two. And because the 4 is a bigger than, much bigger than 1, we know it's going to start to get steeper. So it should be pretty steep. So this one is the steeper one. So that's our answer. So we'll continue all the way till the end, answering all the questions. Once we get to the end, we'll go ahead and click Next. This will send you to your Before You Go. Complete your Before You Go and then submit your work on Google Classroom.